A reading from Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront, confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Word of God. Word of life. Thanks be to God. So when I was asked to preach today, um, I, like any good student, immediately went on to Working Preacher, checked all the lectionaries for today, and read through them. And like any good student, I chose this text over all the others because I thought it was really pretty. <laughs> and as I learned more about it and read into it, I was surprised to see that people who are far more educated than I am seem to avoid this text at all costs. I think the tenacity and vigor with which that speaker speaks is a little hard to understand for some, but God helps me and has given me the tongue of a teacher, so I will be brave and speak on this. <laughs> However, in reading this text, I think there's a fine line between boldness and idiocracy. The writer is quite literally adding fuel to the fire when they say that they set their face like flint. I mean, is God actually asking us to throw ourselves into fire and to let our beards be pulled out? Because if so, I have a lot to reconsider, mostly because I can never have a beard to grow out and be pulled out. <laughs> but also, I really don't want to be thrown into a fire. So the short answer is that the writer does all these things because God is with him. But if you're like me, that's not quite satisfactory. Um, I know for myself, I have a hard time when people just kind of blanket statements say, you can do all things through Christ. Because can I? I mean, for me, I'm a really bad ice skater. Uh, that's just a fact. And I know if I put a lot of time and effort into it, I could get a lot better and more confident than I am right now. But I think at this point in my life, I will never be a figure skating Olympian. And don't worry, I've made peace with that a long time ago. But more seriously, I think this statement doesn't take into account the realities that people live in. Um, because we are capable of doing impossible things, even if we can't do everything. And speaking of doing impossible things, um, I think many of us have probably heard of situations where people who either are in life-threatening situations or have a loved one who's in a life-threatening situation do something they could never do otherwise to save themselves or somebody they love. I know I remember something in the news where a guy was near a car crash and like the car was about to like fall on him and he just pushed it away. And if you were to ever have him repeat that, there's no way. And on a different vein, I had a friend who, when he was a lot younger, his dad had a heart attack and fainted in a very unsafe area. And his sister, who was only a little bigger than him, dragged her dad out of there when she was at the time maybe a third of his size. Again, would not be able to replicate that. And so with these things, if people put themselves in those situations of trying to do those acts, it would be completely foolish. But sometimes we're thrown into situations where we don't have a choice and that the only thing we can do is the impossible. So just like we are motivated in those life-threatening situations, we're also motivated by the evil that exists and is true in the world. God similarly calls us to do impossible tasks in the face of evil. And with Palm Sunday on the horizon, I think this text really fits in well with the idea that Jesus quite literally rode a donkey straight into conflict. 
and his march was an act of resistance against those that would kill him, and also an act of solidarity with those who were oppressed by the system. And some perhaps thought this was completely foolish, but he was brave because he had God on his side. Ira Driggers on Working Preachers said, Jesus won't tone down God's love to avoid death. There are so many horrible reasons and things going on in the world that cause God's beloved people and creatures to be oppressed throughout the world today. We can think of the same country that Jesus rode into, the same city Jesus rode into over 2,000 years ago that's still torn by conflict today. We can think of all the countries we continue to pray for every week that are war-torn. And we can think of those trapped in systems of abuse because of the heaviness that white supremacy has in our culture. And I'm sure you don't need my help in naming a slew more of ways in which oppression is really real. But I think the beauty of this text that initially struck me to choose it for today is how deeply Christian the call is um, to be faithful to an ideal of goodness and godliness and to not back down from it when it gets hard. We believe that we can do great things through God and fight evil. When the author wrote this, they were trying to empower people that were in exile. And for those deeply oppressed in their own lives who may or may not be here today, I cannot tell you what actions are or aren't safe or possible for you to take in your own life. The one thing I can say is that if the only thing you can do is simply to believe that you are capable of doing great things through God, that in itself is a huge act of resistance. Because the people who are oppressing you don't want you to believe that. And as long as you believe that God loves you and sees you as strong and worthy and capable, that is courageous and very brave. But for those of us who are not living in extreme oppression, how do we read this when we're not living in exile? I think one simple answer is that one doesn't need to be a victim in order to see the ways that others are being victimized in the world. And while those that are living under oppressive systems certainly are capable of fighting for themselves, there's no reason that they need to do it alone. As the reading says, let us stand up together. Many of us, myself included, could easily live in a state of ignorant bliss and use our privilege to avoid being confronted with all the evils that are in the world. But we are all called to fight against evil, not just those who are being oppressed, all of us. And usually, fighting against evil calls us into places that make us feel scared or uncomfortable. So friends, as we leave today, let us be bold, perhaps even a little idiotic, Stand up together and fight against evil, knowing that when we have God on our side, we can do miraculous and amazing things. Amen.